Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to you. My name is Richard Orme from the DAISY Consortium and I'm your host for today's webinar, The Art and Science of Describing Images. Whether we're creating accessible Word, HTML, EPUB or PDF documents or posting to social media, we need to know about describing images. It's a skill applicable across many job functions and disciplines and there's always more to learn. In our webinar a month ago, describing images in publications, we had an overview of basic principles, a look at tools, tips and training. We heard how some publishers are managing image descriptions as part of their workflow and we learned about the future potential of artificial intelligence to automate image description. If you missed it, then the video, transcript and slide deck is available on our website. In today's session, we get into practical specifics. You will learn four golden editing tips to help you craft effective descriptions. Then we'll walk through examples of popular image types from Shakespeare to pancakes via Freddie Mercury. Then after the presentations, we'll pick up any questions we haven't got to. But at this point, I'll hand over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Valerie Morrison and I work at CIDI, the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm Hugh Alexander, I'm Director at Textbox and we are an image description company uh, working mainly with publishers um, and we're also the home of Aspire, the evaluation of accessibility statements. Uh, service as well. So I'm um, glad to be here and, and hello to all of you. I am glad to be here too and I just want to give everyone a brief overview about what we're going to be covering today. So I'm going to start um, with some editing tips for after you've written your wonderful image description, how to go back and use different lenses to help craft your alt text and edit it so that it's really efficient and well honed. And then I'll be handing things over to Hugh to finish up, who will be describing the most popular image types. And he has some really great, exciting images that I'm looking forward to hearing him talk about. So I am uh, the eText manager at CIDI and have been working there for about eight or nine years now. And we make accessible versions of course material for higher ed students. We also serve a wider population than that, but our core customers, the people that we serve, are students who have various print related disabilities. So myself and all of the people on my um, great team are very, experienced in writing a high volume of alt text and we've have had to really develop skills to figure out how to edit the alt text as well. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. Before I started working at um, CIDI, I was an English instructor, English instructor of literature and composition at UGA for 10 years. So hopefully I can uh, remember some of my old grammar and editing skills so that I can try and pass that along to you all today. So just before we even start, we wanted to kind of uh, give an overview um, Richard had mentioned that we had had a previous webinar on describing images in publications and we covered the basic approach to image description. So in case you haven't had a chance to view that webinar, I wanted to go over the basics of um, some of the material that I covered on how I approach writing image description. So I always try and begin with one general informative sentence. Um, and that gives people a framework um, for the basic idea in the image or the basic content. And then you can start general and fill in the details as needed. That helps someone listening get a general idea and then fill in the specifics. 
You always want to use proper grammar, spelling, and punctuation in your alt text description. It will be read correctly and predictably that way by screen reading software. And there are many different, excuse me, <clears throat> different types of screen readers out there. So um, you want to be able to make sure that you're spelling out acronyms or symbols um, whenever possible so that no matter what screen reading software, you know it's going to be pronounced correctly. So some screen readers, when they get to a capital U, capital S, they're going to interpret that as United States. Some screen readers might read that as an all caps us and adjust the pitch higher and kind of yell us at the person listening. Um, others might just not even just say US, right? So if you want to indicate the United States, the best and most predictable, reliable way to do it is to spell it out. You also want to avoid hard line breaks because screen readers might pause or end reading your alt text description. So if you are writing an alt text description, don't insert a hard line break by, press, by pressing enter and then going to a new paragraph. Put everything in one paragraph. Uh, and hopefully you're not getting to the paragraph stage. A lot of the tips I'm going to be giving um, today are about trying to um, edit things down so you only have a few sentences in your alt text description. And then finally, um, considering providing information in multiple modalities, that could include if you have a very long alt text description, taking some of that out of the alt text and providing it as a caption instead, or taking um, lots and lots of data from a chart, for example, and creating a table um, alongside it. If you have an infographic that has a lot of data, pull that data out and create a table underneath your image, and then your image description doesn't have to have all that data inside the alt text. Um, so that's a lot to cover. That's, that's a, a lot. And if you are interested in getting kind of more information on any of that, please go ahead and go to daisy.org forward slash webinars and you can find all of their wonderful, helpful resources and webinars that they've recorded, including the one that we did last month on describing images in publications. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the art of editing. It really is an art form. Um, and I have a little icon here of a pencil, old school editing symbol. Whenever possible, uh, try to have multiple people reviewing your alternative text to ensure clarity and to catch orders, or to, sorry, to catch errors. See, I just did an error there. Uh, I consider myself a very careful writer and I used to teach grammar every day uh, to young students who could not care less about it, which only made me more passionate about it. And I make errors when I write alt text. I'm horrified when I go back and I look at my own writing when I'm writing image description. And it's because my brain is so busy trying to translate that visual information into language that whatever cognitive process that's trying to edit while I write, it's out the window, it's gone. So um, try to get someone else to review your alt text if possible. Uh, if it's just you, um, I would, I would argue what I would tell my writing students, give yourself time. So if you could write your alt text description one day and come back to edit it and look at it with fresh, with a fresh perspective the next day, that's the best. Um, and then if you can't, I have organized my own editing um, lenses into four different categories. So these are four different tips that can help you um, really refine and hone and craft your alt text to make it more effective. So editing tip number one, and here I have a crystal icon uh, to represent providing clarity. So you want to use specific precise language whenever possible. Simplify your word choice and avoid 
lots of jargon, um, simplify things and describe them in plain language if possible. Again, writing out any acronyms or symbols so it's very clear and it's pronounced correctly for the listener. Um, and then using proper grammar and punctuation. Sometimes I'll see alt text that's very, very descriptive, very information filled, but it kind of is not effective because there's no punctuation. It's all one long list, a laundry list, or a run on sentence with dashes. And someone listening to that information really needs really needs the information to stop at certain points, right? You need that pause that a comma or a period will provide. So editing to provide clarity would be looking at your language, making sure it's clear, concise, um, and writing everything out clearly. So second editing tip would be organizing your information in clear and predictable ways. And I have a filing cabinet here to represent um, what I wish the interior of my mind looked like on the regular. Um, but you want to organize things in predictable ways for the person listening so they kind of get in the rhythm of your image description. They have to do less work because they understand how you're approaching the description of images. So working from general to specific is always key. And then beyond that, using parallel sentence construction to describe things. So if you, for instance, had a bar graph with many, many bars of information, you would want to describe those bars in the same sentence construction each time, not reinvent the wheel as you go um, to confuse the listener. You want them to be able to paint a, men a mental picture, an image, um, and envision what you are describing in clear, consistent ways. Grouping like items and organizing information in predictable ways, that's also key and very helpful. And then describing images by their similarities first and their differences second. So if I were to use a very simple um, example of a barnyard filled with animals and farming equipment, um, it's an image of a very busy farm, right? Um, I would want to maybe not just list everything like, oh, and there's a chicken and a cow and a tractor and a man and a lady and a cat and a cow and a horse and another horse and a fence, right? Grouping those items in logical ways, right? Uh, working from general to specific. So providing an overview first, um, of, you know, a, a painting of a farm with many animals and farm equipment would be my first sentence. And then maybe if you need to, if it's relevant, count how many different animals, right? You know, 10 horses, two cows, four chickens, and a dog. <laughs> and if it's not necessary, then just say a variety of farm animals. So grouping your items in um, predictable, easy to digest ways is another way you can step back from the alt text you've written and edit it for clarity. Editing tip number three would be trying to remain neutral whenever possible. So after you've written your alt text description, step back and think sometimes less is more and knowing what not to say is important too. So don't try to instruct in your alt text. Every once in a while I'll be asked to describe an image in a textbook that I have to reverse Google search and then I get led down the Wikipedia rabbit hole and want to copy and paste that into my alt text description because I found this really cool information about a Native American beading process, right? Um, not all of that is relevant and so just describe what is contained in the image and stop yourself there. Also try not to, uh, I would say, soap opera eyes your alt text. Try not to invent um, thoughts and feelings behind um, people's expressions. You can 
say that someone looks sad or wistful or angry. You could describe uh, what their face is doing, but try not to interpret or, um, you know, play armchair psychologist and figure out, interpret what they're feeling. And then removing references to gender, age, sex, race, race or ethnicity if they're not relevant to the content or the context. So if I were describing a workplace, a photo of a workplace environment with several coworkers sitting around a table together, I would probably just leave it at that, several coworkers, not gender specific or not age specific. But if I were describing an image in a chapter on sexual harassment or workplace ethics, the, um, the age or the gender or race might become relevant. And so really making those decisions based on context, but remaining neutral whenever possible. And my icon here is a kind of neutral smiley face. He's not smiling. He's not frowning. He's just there. And then my fourth tip would be to reduce redundancy whenever possible. So if you are directly repeating information in the caption or the paragraph preceding, try to edit that down so it's less wordy. Cutting unnecessary phrases such as a photo of or is shown trying, you know, once you once you know some of these phrases, you'll see them pop up over and over again. Try to cut down on them if possible. Um, avoid repeating the caption and then describe the meaning of symbols and how they function, not what they look like. So for example, if you're describing um, a map and there are all kinds of symbols on the map, don't get, get caught up in the color or appearance of the symbols. Try and focus on what those symbols represent. All of these editing tips, um, please keep in mind that you also want to be reducing the length of alt text if possible. The best practice for alt text length is 125 characters or around the length of a tweet. And I have the Twitter logo here as my um, inspiration. The JAWS screen reading software, and um, it's one of the most popular screen readers out there, it processes alt text in 125 character chunks, and it pauses, uh, the default setting for JAWS will pause reading after it reaches 250 characters, and it will prompt the listener to press other buttons or keys or do other options, tab, what have you, in order to continue reading. People can set their default settings or they can change their default settings to make the uh, reading more verbose so that they hear all of the alt text. But if you do have really, really long alt text, I would always advocate to provide it as a caption instead because you're really trying to make the alt text work too hard. And it also has, it has the, uh, can possibly backfire on you and put a strain on someone's cognitive load. So this is my last slide and I'll be handing things over to my next presenter in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to pause and really emphasize that you want to remember that often less is more. And uh, the average person can remember about seven items or words at a time, plus or minus two. So let's look at this in a pessimistic way and just, you know, hedge our bets and say that a person can remember maybe five items at a time reliably. And my uh, image here is a person with lots of gears and cogs and wheels in their brain representing how hard someone has to work. Um, just living in today, in today's world we're feeling a lot of this work, right? Um, but when you are listening to alt text, you are doing a lot of extra work that someone who is reading the text who might be cited, they might not have to do as much mental work to get that information or content. So introducing fewer words, fewer sentences, really editing things down helps the listener process information more efficiently. 
Um, there's a lot less gear turning in their head if the alt text description is shorter and more efficient. Um, and really when you are simplifying things and editing them down for clarity and organizing them clearly, you're helping someone get that content and move it from their working memory into their long-term memory, which is the goal, and reducing that uh, possibility for auditory fatigue. So I am going to go ahead and hand things over to Hugh. Excellent. Thank you so much, Valerie. Perfect. Perfect. Before I start, I, I was just thinking those are really great points. And, and um, your, your point about reviewing um, and have, having your book text reviewed by someone else is, is fantastic. But I'm just thinking um, if, if you don't have someone else, one, one, of, the, one of the kind of options that, that I tend to do is that if you um, copy and paste your old text, put it into a Word document and then have it read allowed to you by by the automated feature in in, in word and um, it's a really great way of, of picking up um, kind of errors and and the pauses and everything like that so that that could be an option for for you if you don't have anyone close to hand to read to read your alt text just uh, just made me think whilst you're talking there anyway um, as I say I'm Hugh Alexander I'm from Textbox and I'm going to be talking about um, the most popular image types that, that we tend to work on, most of our work is to do with um, academic textbooks. Um, so a lot of these images will probably be familiar to, to most of you. Um, I think there's seven in total um, and we're just going to walk through each one. Um, so if I can move on the slide, there we go. What I'm mainly going to be talking about is the focus locus method that we've developed. When I kind of started doing all text and, and long description work, image description work, um, I, I found it quite daunting, to be honest. It was like, where do you begin with certain images, especially with complex images? So we kind of developed this focus locus method, which really ties in with what Valerie was saying earlier about um, moving from the general to the specific. So you've got that, that main focus, the main subject area of, of, of the image, and then you're moving through um, and developing a pathway through that image and, and adding the details as you go along. So the locus elements are the details and the focus is where you really start. So we like to kind of talk about it in terms of scene setting and um, storytelling. So you're creating an overview, that kind of first sentence, which is generally uh, the alt text. Um, and in the longer description, um, you're, you're building up the structure of, of that image so that someone can visualize it. So it's the scene setting is, is here, here's what's in this image, very brief kind of general overview. And then um, talking about the structure, um, we can show you some examples in a, in a short while. Um, so you're setting up the scene and then you're telling the story about that image um, and describing it using um, going from, as, as Valerie mentioned earlier, going from that general to the specific, going through the details and creating a pathway through the image. So the image types we're going to talk about today are bar charts, bar charts line charts, Venn diagrams, um, flow charts, scatter plots and photographs. Um, we have got details for other ones, but I think that's going to be um, in a later um, Sit part of this series of, of webinars on image description. So we're going to concentrate on the seven most popular ones for now. So bar charts. Um, the description of a bar chart needs to reference the following data elements. Um, the title of the chart, um, that's generally going to be your first, first sentence in, in the description. Um, always thinking about in terms of the structure and um, think about the direction. Um, this is something that often gets forgotten um, with bar charts. They can be horizontal or vertical. So uh, to aid the kind of visualization uh, process uh, for the user, uh, just let them know whether it's a vertical or horizontal bar chart. Um, then you're talking about the structure of the chart itself, the y-axis and the x-axis and, and the measurement values and the range um, and the variables actually being measured. Um, you're talking about each data point um, and when you're describing the data work from left to right um, and if it's a horizontal one from it depends really you can go from bottom to top or top to bottom but just just let the user know which way you're going so if we take an example um, this slide is called charting Hollywood this is the top 10 box office films of 2019 um, and it's a vertical bar chart so if we go through 
description. And each of the descriptions here, the um, the first sentence basically is is highlighted in red, just to, just to show that that's basically going to be the alt text um, for each when you put it into your EPUB. For instance, the alt text will say a vertical bar chart illustrates the top ten films at the worldwide box office in 2019. So a very brief overview. So your uh, user or reader will know. Oh, is that of interest to me? Um, sounds good, um, and then they can decide whether they want to go on to the long description. Um, so the long description goes on, the box office take in millions of US dollars is plotted on the y-axis with a range of, of zero to three billion dollars, um, and then the te ten films are plotted on the x-axis. So you've immediately you've done a, a general overview and then you've um, provided a structure um, of the actual bar chart. So. Your, your user immediately knows that it's going to be a measurement. The top, top whack of, of, of um, box office is going to be $3, million, uh, $3 billion, um, and they know that there's 10 films, so they immediately know what to expect. Um, so just having that 10 is, is quite important there. So if you just said the films are plotted, you wouldn't quite know exactly um, how many... Uh, Kind of films are going to be on the actual chart so it could be 27 films um but but just providing as much information up front so that the people aren't surprised is really helpful i won't you, go through all um, the data. can i ask you a clarification question so you've you've used the terms alt text and long description yeah um, are you saying that that first sentence the vertical bar Mm -hmm. uh, chart illustrates that is the alt text and the remainder yes. of the text is a long description and what's the difference between those two things okay yes so the the first sentence here we're, we're using as the alt text so the alt text will be coded into the um, epub file and the long description provides you an opportunity to provide uh, to provide more detail basically um, if you were going to as Valerie was saying earlier, it's very difficult to provide um, all this information in an alt text. You have a, a limited uh, amount of space in terms of characters and a limited amount of um, ability to use things like lists. You can't use a list in, in an alt text. So in order to provide um, the, the full detail of, of the description, you need to have a, a long description which is connected to that image. Um, and there's various ways of doing that. And I believe that um, there is a seminar or webinar um, from Daisy coming up in the next uh, couple of months on how to um, introduce long descriptions into EPUB files. Does that help at all? That's a great uh, explanation, thank you. And yes, we will talk about that. So the technique you use for including the longer description or extended description will vary on your format. But thank you for the clarification as you go through these concepts. Please come no, no to your slide deck. No problem at all. No problem at all. Basically, the, the concept with long description is you're linking out to to an, another um, page within the book um, that, that holds the, the description, and then you can link back to to the actual image and, and place in, in the uh, in the text. Um, so here the the data points. I'm not going to go through them all because they're quite a lot. Um, Avengers Endgame is the um, top number one uh, film last year with a worldwide gross of uh, $2,797,000, etc. Um, and then it's broken down into US domestic and um, international. So it's a stacked bar chart. So you're, what you're doing is, if you think about a bar chart, and, and it's the same with a, a lot of these uh, types of image, you think about where they came from, they generally came from something like Excel. Uh, from a spreadsheet perhaps or a Google chart um, and in their original form they were a list so you're basically taking it back to its original form um, and using a list. A list is really a friend in terms of, of, of writing these descriptions. It's as, as Valerie said it's very good to have it um, an organized approach and having it listed um, out like this creates that structure and people know where they are so especially with a, a, a numbered list like this they know that if um, number four is Spider-Man and number five is Captain Marvel they, they don't get lost in, in the process um, so that's that's for bar charts it's basically as I say going you think about where the, the source data and you're basically recreating that approach the pie charts um, pie charts need to reference the following data elements the title again of the pie chart um, is 
part of the general overview. Um, you're talking about the structure and the design of the chart. So what kind of pie chart is it? Is it just a standard pie chart? Is it exploded pie chart, which we've, we've got images on the right hand side of the screen here? Or is it a, a three dimensional uh, type of pie chart? Well, it, it's just useful to, to provide this kind of information so that people uh, can visualize again. Um, talk about the number of variables, and the data points for each variable, um, these may be a value, or they may be a percentage, or they may be both. Um, it depends on uh, who's created that pie chart. Um, and when describing the data, organize the data into size order, because this really helps the user to visualize and understand the chart. So um, basically, like if, if, if it's in size order, it, it doesn't have any surprises, then you, you're not suddenly get to the last variable and it's like, oh, by the way, this one's 27%. So um, it just it helps um, understanding basically. Um, and if there is color um, in the uh, pie chart, if it's integral, then include it, but otherwise um, it's not that necessary. It basically is being used to make it look pretty. Um, so you don't necessarily always need to have color um, included in the description. So if we take an example. So this is a pie chart of Shakespearean death counts, which is useful information for anyone, I should imagine. Um, the pie chart is, is basically um, listing out all the different ways that people die um, in Shakespeare plays. Um, the, the most popular, if, if that's the right word, most popular word, way of, of method of death is being stabbed um, and then being stabbed and poisoned um, and things like that. Um, it's, a, it's a really um, fun world in Shakespeare. And I think most of these happen in Titus and Dronicus, so um, not a great time to be around. Maybe that's get, common rather than popular. Yes, common, yeah, yeah. Popular death ways, brilliant. Um, <laughs> things that we learned today. Um, so this slide is called Exit Pursued by Bear, and there's a small bear in the bottom right hand corner um, chasing you. Um, and the pie chart is, illustrates the various causes of death in Shakespeare's plays. That's highlighted in red, we're using that as the old text. And then the longer description would be, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 22 causes of death are listed within the chart. So immediately you're saying, you're providing the user with that, that information. They know how many um, causes of death to expect in the list. It just provides upfront information. Um, there are 62 deaths in total, and they're listed here in order of frequency together with the percentage of the total. So as I said, um, goes through, provide a, a numbered list. Um, stabbed is 48% uh, of the total. So 30 people are stabbed to death in, in Shakespeare plays. Um, and then beheaded, poisoned, stabbed and, and poisoned, hanging, all the fun ones at the top. Um, but baked into a pie comes in at six, um, broken heart at seven with 2% of the total, smothered by a pillow. Um, the best one being uh, throws oneself away. Uh, that's 1% of, of, of all the uh, deaths in Shakespeare. I'm not quite sure what that actually means, but you get the idea. And then 22, the final one is 1% uh, again, um, is disappears. So we shall disappear from this slide. Line charts. Um, line charts are, um, again, very kind of straightforward, uh, again, probably coming from a spreadsheet. So again, you need the title of the chart, the structure of the chart, and what the y-axis title is and the measurement value and range, um, the x-axis title and the variables being measured, uh, the data points for each variable, and, and work from left to right um, across the chart. So if we take an example, and um, this slide is, is a toy story, um, we have a line chart which uh, depicts or illustrates the, the gross sales of Mattel um, by region worldwide um, from 2009 to 2017. And this is being measured in millions of US dollars. So the description goes, the object being a line chart describes the gross sales of Mattel by region between 2009 and 2017. So now the user knows what to expect in the image. Is it interesting to them? Yes, so let's go to the um, long description. So the chart um, is measured in US dollars in millions on the y-axis and in years on the x-axis. Data um, are provided for five regions, North America, Europe, 
Latin America, Asia and other. And the data points in millions of dollars are as follows. But please note that no data are provided for other between 2013 and 2017. It's quite useful if there are missing kind of data points, just to point that out, just so that people think, oh, have they forgotten to, to add that? So if there are missing ones, then, then make a note of that in your description. And then we just, again, we're creating a list uh, from 2009 through to 2017. Um, and each one um, has North America, Europe, Latin America, Asia, and other. Um, so with data points for each one. So basically, again, a list is your friend in this process. So it's a really great way of organizing that data into something that's uh, easily consumable by the, by the reader. Next one is scatter plot. So these are a little bit more challenging. Um, these need to reference again. It's the, the a title of the chart, the structure of the chart with um, X and Y um, titles and the measurement values and ranges for, for each axis. Um, the data point for each variable, perhaps. Now uh, that's a perhaps and we'll come to that um, because as you know, scatter plots do tend to have a lot of data points. Um, when describing the data work from left to right across the scatter point chart, um, if the chart contains a significant number of data points, which is something I call mass data, then a trend analysis may be used to provide the user with a kind of an overview. Um, and if a trend line is included, this should also be described. Um, the thing with scatter plot charts, I've seen ones recently that had 500 points on them and you really don't want to um, list out 500 data points. It's, it's going to be time consuming for you. It's going to be the most boring thing on earth for the person who's reading it. Um, and when, if you think about scatter plots, um, you're, as a, as a sighted viewer, you're looking at it and you're looking for trends anyway. You're not looking at every single data point and thinking, oh, what's the value, exact value of that one? You're looking for trends. Um, so, you're, so you're looking at a scatter plot and hoping to get an idea um, within a few seconds. So um, if there are 500 points, um, don't list them all. It's, uh, I think it's a waste of, of everyone's time. This slide is entitled Coffee Break. Uh, it's a scatter plot of coffees versus maximum daily temperature, uh, which is plotted in Fahrenheit, um, with maximum daily temperature on the x axis and coffees on the y axis. So, um, the slide is called Sunbuck, um, mainly because coffee and temperature what else to call it. Um, a scatter plot chart explores the relationship between coffee, sales, uh, to daily temperature. So that's going to be the alt text. And then the number of coffees sold is plotted on the x-axis with a range from 0 to 50 at intervals of 10. The maximum daily temperature uh, in Fahrenheit is plotted on the x-axis um, with a range from 20 to 80 degrees at intervals of 10. So again, you're just creating that structure so that people are, are, are aware of what, the, what they should be thinking about in terms of uh, what's been provided in the, uh, in the chart itself. There are 49 pl values plotted on the graph. Always useful to, to provide the number of um, values. Again, that's quite a lot. So we don't really want to list out 49 values. So we provide a trend analysis. So a larger number of coffees are sold when the temperature is below 40 degrees. Below 40 degrees, the range of sales is between 12 and 48, with an estimated average of 28 per day. Above 40 degrees, the range of sales is between 4 and 22, with an estimated average of 8 per day. So you're just providing that overview um, so that, that people can get uh, the gist, kind of get an idea of, of what that uh, scatter plot is trying to tell you. Next one, uh, photographs. Photographs tend to um, uh, be uh, just describable in, in just all text, really, unless they're terribly complicated. Uh, you can generally get um, uh, alt text for, for most photographs. So the things that you need to include, if there's a title of the photograph, that would be useful. And if it's not um, already been used in the caption, um, the main subject of the photograph, the actions, what's happening in the photograph, um, any emotions visible within the, in the image, whether people are laughing or smiling and, or, um, or sad or whatever it may be, um, the location and conditions if they are applicable, so kind of weather and things like that, or whether they're in a, a town or a countryside scene, um, and if the photographer or source is, is um, not provided as part of the um, caption then it would be quite useful to, to include that especially if it's a, a well-known photographer. 
Uh, here's an example. Um, slide is called Give Peace a Chance, and it features two rather famous people um, in bed in, in a uh, Hilton Hotel in Amsterdam in 1969. Yes. So this is a really famous uh, image of John Lennon and Yoko Ono um, when they did their peace process uh, protest in, in Amsterdam in the late 60s. So the alt text would read, John Lennon and Yoko Ono sit up in bed during their 1969 honeymoon peace process pro protest in the presidential suite of the Amsterdam Hilton Hotel. So that gives you kind of pretty much all the information you probably need. Um, again, going back to the focus locus approach, John Lennon and Yoko Ono are the focus of this image. So it's, we start with them and then move through the other um, details about the presidential suite and the Hilton and, and they're sitting up in bed, things like that. Um, if this, again, it's, it's context. Um, you, you could rewrite this if you were the Hilton Hotel. You could say, oh, um, the presidential suite at the um, Amsterdam Hilton Hotel, um, uh, you can see a, a scene with a bed in it. Uh, there are two people in the bed and um, there's with floor to ceiling windows behind. There's nothing wrong with that, but it just doesn't tell you the, the kind of real subject to this photo, which the two people in the bed are John Lennon and Yoko Ono and what they're doing. If you're doing something like a, a history of art photography, um, course and you need a longer description then you can go um, into more detail with this image so Lennon oh no are smiling and wearing pajamas they're each holding a white tulip Lennon his shoulder length hair parted in the center wears his trademark wire rimmed round glasses and oh no wears her long dark hair down a guitar lays across the couple's legs and a tape recorder sits at the foot of the bed the bed is flanked by large bouquets of flowers Behind the couple are floor to ceiling windows looking out over Amsterdam and two slogans are taped to the windows. One reads hair piece and the other bed piece in capital letters. So again, you're going from the, that initial focus, the John Lennon and the Yoko Ono, and then moving in a pathway through the description um, and, and de providing all the details, the guitar, the tape recorder, um, the, the bouquets of flowers flowcharts moving quickly and um, the description of flowchart basically um, you need the title of flowchart the structure of the chart number of tiers and layers um, in decision trees you need to reference things um, because shapes represent such things like diamonds are um, represent a decision uh, rectangles are a process and ovals are a terminator and you need to talk about the direction of travel so let's go through in a quick example this is um, a slide is called what Freddy wants and it, it depicts and um, Freddie Mercury, what he wants through his song lyrics. So a flowchart illustrates what Freddie Mercury wants through his lyric. The um, flowchart has three levels and develops from north to south. Again, that structural description. So you can really visualize what, you're, what the image is trying to depict. At the top of the chart is a box labeled Freddie Mercury. The next level contains three boxes labeled wants, doesn't want and isn't sure about. And the last level contains six options. So you end up with six pathways through um, that flow through the flow chart. And these are as follows. So one, again, we're going into a list, an organized list. So one, Freddie Mercury wants to break free. Two, he wants to ride his bicycle. Freddie Mercury wants it all and he wants it now. Uh, number four, Freddie Mercury wants to make a supersonic man out of you. He doesn't want you to stop him now. And number six, Freddie Mercury isn't sure about living forever. So you're just creating a structural pathway through the description. Um, Venn diagram. Venn diagrams consist of um, a list of elements basically interacting with each other. So you need to state the number of variables and the labels, identify the focus point, identify the pathway which is the left to right or clockwise generally clockwise for the three um three circle uh, venn diagrams and then reference the labels as you move through so um uh, slide title being venn um a venn diagram with three intersecting circles labeled in a clockwise direction egg milk and flour the flour and egg circles are positioned above the milk circle to create a triangular shape the intersections in a clockwise direction are as follows. Egg intersects with milk to create omelet. Milk intersects with flour to create batter. Flour intersects with egg to create pasta. Egg, flour and milk intersect to create pancake at the center of the Venn diagram. So again, you're using that list to create structure. 
finally, and I think we're going to be talking about this more in our, in our next session, um, we've developed a, a process called Sector. So this is just something to think about when you've got very complex um, images uh, and illustrations. This is an illustration, a two-page illustration from um, Stardust by Neil Gaiman, beautifully illustrated um, graphic novel. Um, and if you've got something this detailed with this much information, it's really useful to, to divide the image up into either, either quadrants or talk about it in the north, east, south, west. Or in this case, um, we've used a, a clock face approach. So it's divided into 12 sections. So you can talk about each section and the details that are happening in that section. So it's just a way of, of dealing with really complex um, images and paintings in, in particular, where there's a lot of information that you need to convey. But I think we'll cover a lot more about that in the next session. That's me just about wrapped up. I think we're, we're pretty good for time. So um, we will be having um, a Q&A session um, if Richard has some questions for us. We have quite a few questions lined up and not too much time. Something I think several people would really welcome some clarification on is this distinction between alt text, the picture caption and the long description. Could you, could you help us out, both of you, I think, uh, on where, where information goes and how you make those distinctions? I've been sitting here looking at the questions coming in, so I've had a minute to think about them. If I could field this one first, and then we could also get Hugh's perspective after. Um, if we could go back to the slide that had John Lennon and Yoko Ono, I think that provides such a great example. And if you could actually go to that next one, yes. I think that this is a perfect example that Hugh put together of the difference to me between alt text and a caption. So in the red um, description that he has at the top for his alt text, he's just written one or two sentences that provide an overview and a general description of the content. I would call this brief alt text. So his brief alt text is John Lennon and Yoko Ono sit up in bed during their 1969 honeymoon peace protest in the presidential suite of the Amsterdam Hilton Hotel. And then that longer description down below about the tulips, the flowers, how their hair, what they're wearing, their clothing, to set the scene and the mood and give more cultural context. I think that could be moved into either long description or if you have the ability to put it in a caption. So it really depends on whether you're able to manipulate the content yourself or if you're remediating something. Um, so, uh, in my experience, I'm always remediating, right? I'm not the publisher. I'm working to make something accessible after the fact. And so I don't have the option of moving this information into a caption. The caption is going to be available for everyone. So any individual is going to be able to read that and really get some more background. And then you're saving um, just the visual just the visual details for your alt text description. So that's what, how I would break things up, right? Your, your alt text should be the visual description and provide a quick overview. And then a caption or a long description should go into further detail, provide cultural context and really kind of go in more depth or as, more, as much depth as you're interested in providing. And Hugh, did you want to add to that? Yeah, that's an absolutely fantastic explanation. Um, one, one thing that, that's worth bearing in mind uh, for publishers in particular, if you're, if you're providing images, um, a, a really good kind of a caption underneath the, um, underneath the image can be very, very useful in terms of, I, I see a lot of, of images that don't have any kind of title of what that image is. And you can actually, if you have some great kind of title captions for your, 
for your images, then you often won't need that whole text because you've already provided that information. So you can provide an, a, an empty alt tag. So it can save you some time and some costs as well. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're providing good title captions for, for, for your images and, and for your um, graphics throughout your book. So what I heard there was that the picture caption is available to everyone. Uh, who's using assistive technology or not seeing or not using assistive technology that provides context and, and uh, um, a title for that picture. The alt text is short alt text that's available only to someone who's using assistive technology and the long or extended description that's when you need to expand when your alt text is just not sufficient to describe or uh, bring out the data perhaps that's uh, in the image. Is that a fair summary of what you both said there? Absolutely, yeah, no, that's great. Yes. Um, and Sue had the question, which was, again, on this same topic, alt text, we get that, and that's required if the, um, if the uh, image is not described in the surrounding text and it's important to understanding that has to be included, whereas extended descriptions, are they required or optional? Really depends on on the context of the uh, of the of the image. Basically, if 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 you're providing um, information, especially now that textbooks are so visual compared to a, a decade ago, there's so much pedagogy happening in in images. Um, if you think about that, it's kind of being censored. If it's not up to the to the kind of um, visually impaired user, it's being censored because they they're missing out on all that information. So think about your user. Um, are they missing out on the information? Is that information being conveyed within text or is it additional information? Um, I can do, um, we've got a really kind of quite useful flowchart that I can um, go through in the next session uh, about making decisions, so like a decision tree basically about how to decide on, on whether a description is needed or whether all text is sufficient or do you need a longer description or nothing at all? Is it a decorative image? Um, but yeah, it's very much to do with context because you could have the same image in a um, science book and the same image in a geography book and it would have a completely different description or it would have a very short description for one as it's just a kind of general comment and a very long detailed description for another. So it can be, um, it is very much a case by case basis. So I, I wish, that it, wish it was an easier answer, but it is a, a matter of kind of analyzing each image as it comes along. Um, Every, every image doesn't need a long description, but some of these complex ones really benefit from it. And the user, um, it helps the user with understanding and their learning outcomes. So um, if, if you can, and that information isn't conveyed elsewhere, then it should be put into a long description. Thank you, Hugh. You're driving the deck still. So would you be good enough to move back to Valerie's tip number one? please. Oh, uh, while I have a question for Valerie, which is, could you please clarify uh, the alt text length? So uh, 125 um, characters was given as a limit at one point, but then we went to talk about jaws cutting off at 250. Could you just help us a little bit with uh, those, those limits? Sure. So 125 is my goal. It's not an actual limit. Um, 250 characters is where JAWS cuts off and pauses, um, and then you have to press a key to continue. So I would say 250 characters is the default limit for alt text with that specific JAWS screen reader. But my goal is to try and think of alt text as being 125 characters, um, somewhere around the length of one of the original tweets. I'm trying to keep that memory or keep that um, figure in mind, um, but of course I always have to exceed that because it seems like so many, especially in an educational context, you do need to provide above and beyond and go a little bit further than 125 characters. But the 125 is my goal, and then oh, yeah. 250 is the cutoff. Perfect. So Hugh, yeah, back to, uh, so Jayshree and Gary wanted to see uh, tip number one again. They missed that for their note taking. Whilst I have a question on the extended description. So Hugh, in many of your examples, you were kind of giving information 
um, well, the data, I suppose, in some of those graphs in mm. description, longer descriptions, yeah. I've seen though those presented as tables, navigable tables, you know, yeah. more navigable data. Did you want to comment on that? It really is down to your preference. Um, some publishers uh, like um, it part of the description, others um, prefer a table, and it, it really is up, up to the individual publisher. Um, the both are, are valid. Um, I do like the table approach and it's something we are going to be addressing in the next session um, because it, it just provides a lot more independent um, independence for the user. They can jump around in the, in the table as long as it's an accessible table um, using the screen reader. So the table, um, especially if, if there's a huge amount of data, um, can be really useful. One of the things though that I've really noticed um, working with, with publishers is that you'll have the graph um, and it sometimes isn't that clear. You might have 50 data points on there and you're trying to look at the, 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 the book and see, trying to see the data. If, if publishers provided a table of data with each um, graph that they include in their textbook, it would be so, so useful for everyone. Um, to, to get more accuracy um, and, and see exactly um, the, the, the data points. So not just for uh, assistive tech users, for, for everyone if they could have access to those data tables. So there, there really is down to the, the publisher and the, the kind of preference they want. You can write it as, um, in the kind of longhand kind of list form or, or you can use a table. And as I say, we'll, we'll go into more details about um, accessible tables in, in the next session. Thank you. I've tried to do justice to the long list of questions that have come in during and after those presentations. This webinar has all been about describing images and we've learned that many times 250 characters just isn't enough. And there have been questions about how practically to include an extended or long description in the different formats. So we will return to this and we'll try and get to that as soon as we can after we return in September. I'm sorry we weren't able to cram it into this webinar, which we're coming to the end of. Thank you to Valerie and Hugh for sharing great information and insights. We have one more webinar for you before we take a break for August. Next week, your host will be Dara from Ahead Ireland for the session Word to EPUB Extended Tutorial Accessible EPUB in Seconds. In this practical session, I will be joined by Joseph from Berkeley, California, and Nancy from Vancouver, Canada. We'll demonstrate how to get started creating accessible EPUBs from your Word documents using the simple one-click solution. We'll then explain advanced features, including custom styling, page numbering, multiple language support, how to include math, customise metadata and much more. You can register at daisy.org forward slash webinars where you can also sign up to the webinar announcements mailing list. Then in August we give you all a well-earned break but we already have some exciting webinars ready for our return in September. If you'd like to suggest a subject or you're considering presenting a webinar, then please email us at webinars at daisy.org. I hope you'll join us again next week. In the meantime, thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.